I became interested in film at a very, very early age. Um, the story is that uh, at the age of two or three, uh, my parents took me to see Fantasia. And when I saw the poor mouse being drowned, I started to scream and was carried out of the, uh, the theater. So that was my first experience with film. Uh, as I got into um, teenage years, I was a uh, theater inspector with my father. He was a film uh, theater checker. And we used to go around to uh, check audience attendance and uh, payroll, the condition of the uh, theaters. So he'd always drag me around as an excuse to buy a child's ticket, and then uh, my mother went around. We used to have to check the restrooms and see how many people were uh, on the floor. So uh, from the age of about eight or nine, I was seeing three or four movies a week, partially. I seldom st uh, stay from uh, beginning to end. It was really a, a wonderful thing for um, my teenage love life because we always had to buy tickets in pairs. You would count the numbers that were printed on them. And since we had to buy two tickets anyway, my father had no problem with my taking a person of the opposite persuasion uh, to the movies with me. So uh, I'm sure there are a number of uh, little old ladies in Brooklyn right now that remember um, my getting up every hour to buy new tickets and coming back to, uh, to bring them home. Uh, it took an academic turn later on. I was um, an English major uh, through bachelor's and master's, and something didn't quite fit in that, uh, at that time, now we're into the early 60s, uh, the field of English literature was making a turn uh, very abruptly into linguistic analysis, and that's not where I was at. I, was not interested in, in doing that type of criticism. Uh, on the other hand, um, film criticism was just starting to, uh, to blossom as a serious discipline. And I thought, well, here's something that would work out very nicely. My uh, background in literature and criticism and this backlog of um, film experiences that I had uh, seemed to come together very nicely so um, for some reason or other, I got permission as a Jesuit to go off to Stanford uh, to explore their uh, program. And that had grown out of um, social sciences. So it was uh, impact analysis, audience analysis, uh, a lot of mathematical uh, material. Uh, that was intimidating. Uh, I was in a playwriting class and um, the two villains I had in this spy drama were Al Gaul and Fortran, uh, names of two uh, computer programs. Um, at the end of half a master's, I decided it wasn't for me and um, went off to Northwestern, uh, where the film program had grown out of um, theater. So I was much more at home with uh, dramatic literature and theater and that type of criticism. So it uh, matured very, um, gradually one step after another. Uh, by this time, I was um, studying theology as a Jesuit. And um, in the late 50s and into the early 60s, the, uh, the two twin icons uh, were Ingmar Bergman and Federico Fellini, both of whom had theological themes. So I managed to talk to my bosses among the Jesuits and said, well, look, um, this film study is very nice, but it also has this theological dimension, and um, I'm really doing uh, theology as I'm going off to do, uh, do film studies. And uh, for good or ill, they bought it and said, well, in that case, go ahead. So I uh, then completed um, my degree at Northwestern, uh, writing on Lutheran theology in, uh, in Bergman's films, and that was uh, my dissertation that uh, was published as a book. Uh, I finished the, um, the program at uh, Northwestern and uh, did my comprehensives at an odd time and uh, expected fully to uh, apply for faculty positions someplace. And uh, it was such a specialized area, uh, there weren't that many openings, so uh, my Jesuit boss said, uh, well, look, why don't you um, go to America Magazine for a year? 
uh, you can do some publication there, write some articles on film, and that will make your application uh, more attractive in a year or two. It sounded reasonable. Well, 14 years later, I was uh, managing editor and then executive editor at America, and um, it was a long hiatus in a, an academic career, so uh, I had to get back to it uh, later on. So from there, it was Georgetown and um, the Loma Wine College in Syracuse, and, and finally Boston College. America was an interesting uh, interlude. Uh, one way, it was an interruption in my uh, academic life, but on the other hand, it was a very enriching uh, experience. Uh, we had a long-term uh, film reviewer uh, on the staff, Moira Walsh, one of the, um, the giants of um, film reviewing in Catholic circles. And uh, she was running into a stretch of uh, ill health about 1974 or 5. And uh, I started to do uh, reviews to fill in for her. Uh, she finally um, left the scene, and uh, I became full-time reviewer, um, starting, I think, in 1975 or 6. And the column lasted for 35 years. Uh, in the meantime, I was still, um, as uh, managing editor and executive editor, uh, trying to cover all sorts of areas of uh, foreign policy, domestic politics, uh, cultural affairs, uh, religious issues. Remember then it was a time of great ferment in the Catholic Church. We were still trying to work our way through um, Vatican II. Uh, so there are many controversies to comment on. So it was a very broadening experience, which I found really helped in, um, in film criticism from uh, being able to see films from different perspectives and uh, be sensitive to uh, issues that were being raised that I might not have been otherwise. Uh, after uh, 14 years of uh, doing this, uh, and it was a strain really, I didn't realize that at the time, um, the uh, movie uh, companies would have these uh, receptions for reviewers generally on Wednesday evening. You could always tell the quality of the film. If they gave you uh, wine and very nice canapes, uh, you knew the movie was going to be a stinker and they were trying to soften you up for a good review. Uh, if you got a paper cup of water on the way in, you knew it was a great movie and they were confident and didn't have to spend any money for you. <clears throat> But then um, over the weekend, I would write the review and have to submit it by, uh, by Monday, which uh, you know, put quite a strain on uh, my time resources. <clears throat> um, after 14 years, I decided uh, it was time for a change, so uh, I reverted back to the academic world and got a, uh, a chair at um, Georgetown for two years, uh, which I enjoyed very much. <clears throat> and um, I continued uh, reviewing films, but then I didn't have the editorial responsibilities at the same time. Uh, at the end of two years, um, my Jesuit bosses decided to send me up to Syracuse, New York, uh, where we have Le Moyne College and a an novitiate, and uh, be doing some personnel work there. And I was still doing reviews, going out to, to do the reviews, and then... Um, when that uh, assignment ended, um, that's when I came to uh, Boston College as um, uh, the Gasson professor. So uh, I've been there ever since. Um, John Mahalchek uh, and I put together a plan for a uh, film studies program, which would be under the umbrella of the Fine Arts Department, and um, still going strong. Well, certainly that. Um, 14-year period was a hiatus in the academic world for me. Uh, if you can uh, imagine, the last time I taught was a, uh, a graduate seminar when I was a graduate student myself, <clears throat> and that was 1971. 
Now think of what happened during the 70s. And then uh, with no intervening experience in um, 1986, um, going back into a classroom. Um, by that time, we were uh, full flower of uh, grade inflation. The lecture method was finished. It was a greater emphasis on um, class participation. Uh, it was a time of protest. <clears throat> uh, a lot of the uh, academic world was issues-oriented. Uh, of course, the war was dominated uh, during that time. Um, feminism was on the scene. Um, in Catholic universities, um, ecumenism and or breaking down the old patterns of the Catholic college to um, a more inclusive environment. So it was um, quite an adjustment to make for, uh, to a cosmopolitan university like, uh, like Georgetown. Uh, it was quite different from what I uh, expected. Um, the students were um, more outspoken. One of the things that struck me <clears throat> is how grade conscious they had become uh, in that 15-year period. Now, some people have said it was because of the draft deferment that uh, you had to give everybody in class A so they wouldn't be drafted. Um, maybe it was a growing professionalism and competition, I don't know, but um, I found that very hard to cope with uh, since it was very hard to reward an extraordinary student. Um, a lot of students now, I'm talking in general terms here because uh, a class of 30 people, there are all sorts of different individuals there. But the number that um, were more concerned about um, grades and performance rather than content um, was a little hard to adjust to. So um, I guess, at least in the beginning, I did not have the skills that I might have acquired uh, in those intervening 14 years. So uh, it was a hard adjustment to, uh, to make. Um, the academic world had become um, at least to my understanding, uh, so rigid with requirements and um, uh, both for students and faculty and annual reports, uh, things that I really uh, didn't expect. So uh, it was quite a shock coming back into the academic world. But um, after 30 years, I got used to it. <laughs> so um, one of the things that um, I found helpful from the years that I was an editor uh, was writing. Um, I could write fairly quickly on weekends. Uh, the uh, idea of working for a weekly publication is it has to be done now. Uh, academics tend to work on a much different uh, schedule or time order. Uh, it can be done this year or next year. So um, doing the, the writing that was uh, required by my position as a professor um, was something that was just part of the routine. Uh, so I was able to do that uh, on weekends and summers. And um, foolishly, I never took a sabbatical uh, during those 30 years. So um, over the last couple of years, I started to realize Burnout was setting in. It was time for uh, for a different uh, perspective on things. The um, dissertation I did uh, at, in graduate school was a theological perspective, and uh, on Ingmar Bergman. Uh, his father was a Lutheran pastor, and um, as I followed my father around to movie theaters. Uh, he followed his father around to these country churches and uh, listened to the same sermon three or four times uh, every weekend. Uh, I thought, you know, that really had to have a, um, a formative influence on him, so I started to dig around. Uh, he did um, a lot of his uh, design was based on the architecture of these rural churches. Uh, especially his theological period of um, starting with uh, Seventh Seal. Um, 
what I tried to uncover was uh, what were these <clears throat> themes that he would have picked up as a child uh, from being along with his father? How did it shape his um, intellectual and artistic life? How did it influence his images? Uh, he had a play that he wrote called Wood Paintings, uh, just based on the um, the murals that he saw in the uh, in these churches, and that gradually matured into uh, the Seventh Seal. Many the scenes from that. Uh, he went through a period of rebellion and then came back to his theological period. So I tried to you know disentangle what was he rebelling against, uh, what did he find negative, what eventually drew him back, and how did he grow out of it. <clears throat> And I uh, developed this notion of uh, redemptive love, that uh, where his father was preaching about uh, love of um, Jesus is a uh, source of redemption. Uh, he played around with that for a while as he grew away from um, faith commitment. Uh, then it was love between man and woman, so there's always this redemptive woman that comes into his life, and once the character discovers his uh, ability to love and get outside himself, that's where he finds a, a salvation, a psychological salvation, um, even more than a, a spiritual salvation. So that was the uh, the framework of the um, the work I did on Bergman. Then this long hiatus came in, the fourteen years, <clears throat> and um, when I went back to it, I thought, well, you know, this could probably apply to other people too. And that's when I started to um, go into some of the Jewish background of Woody Allen. Uh, last person in the world you would think of as religious, but he did attend um, eight years of Hebrew school. <laughs> so he knows his, uh, his prophets and his commandments and his guilt and sin and all this kind of uh, material. <clears throat> and that comes into his, um, his uh, worldview, the way people relate to one another. Uh, his characters are um, hopelessly neurotic and dealing with guilt. And if you read um, so much of the Old Testament, the prophets are continually berating the people of Israel uh, for their shortcomings, their infidelity, their uh, uh, lack of observance of the law. Uh, they're not living up to the standards that are expected of them. And it comes in and again and again, and it can be comical uh, from a prophetic utterance of uh, somebody like Jeremiah and, and his lamentations to um, a fetching uh, wife or, or mother uh, berating her son for not uh, getting into medical school. So I thought there was a, a coherence there. And um, I did a, uh, a critical study of, uh, of Woody Allen along that line. Um, I thought it contained some good points. It was kind of esoteric, so it, it didn't get uh, you know too much of a following. But then I extended it a little bit, um, the same methodology of um, childhood formative influences, and uh, moved that into the the last full book I did, uh, which was Street Smart, about the effects of New York on these uh, four directors. So um, it was Alan, so I started off with him, Sidney Lumet, uh, two people that would be uh, categorized as New York Jewish filmmakers, but they might just as well have come from different galaxies. Their you know, backgrounds are so different. So uh, then I started to segment it into neighborhoods. <clears throat> that uh, Woody Allen is from a uh, middle-class Jewish neighborhood in Midwood and Flatbush in Brooklyn whereas Sidney Lumet was Lower East Side, Manhattan, sort of a hotbed of uh, the labor movement and socialism. Uh, one was stability and um, community orientation. Uh, the other was um, uh, labor unrest and politics. And um, Allen was self-obsessed. Uh, Lumet was politically obsessed. All the political structures are against you, so he had very negative feelings. So I thought, well, religion is part of it, but uh, there's this whole other social context as well that uh, 
is important in forming the, uh, the scripts that they would pick, the characters that they would create, the way they would have the characters uh, interact. So trying to be ecumenical, <clears throat> I went beyond um, Jewish directors, and um, Sorsese is um, a man I'd written about uh, quite extensively. Um, what was his Catholic background, and how did that influence his gangster movies and his other movies? I would feel very close to Sorsese. We're both products of the uh, New York City Catholic school system. He went to, to school in um, the New York diocese, I went in the Brooklyn Diocese. Uh, he went off to um, a seminary at the age of 13 or 14, only lasted a year. He discovered he liked girls and didn't like Latin, so that was the end of his seminary career. Uh, I went off to the Jesuits in, um, in Brooklyn, and I, by that time, uh, Sorsese's grades were so terribly finished off at Cardinal Hayes High School in um, New York. Uh, I finished off at Brooklyn Prep. His grades were awful. Uh, he didn't get into Fordham. Uh, I was a nerdy little kid from Brooklyn Prep. No problem with Fordham at all. I got, uh, did all my uh, undergraduate and master's degree uh, at Fordham. And I'd often thought, and I mentioned this uh, quite frequently to my classes, that if there were a more imaginative admissions officer at Fordham, uh, Father Sorsese would be teaching this class in film, and I would be a starving novelist in Greenwich Village trying to get uh, my latest novel turned into a, uh, a film. Uh, but it didn't work that way. So uh, here I am, the, the film teacher and, and Jesuit, and uh, Sorsese has had his, uh, his own career. Uh, he is uh, Catholic to the core. Uh, his um, interest is... Um, community, the worst thing for a Catholic is to be excommunicated. So if you're put out of the mob, excommunicated from the mob, it's a death sentence. So this loyalty within the tribe or family uh, just goes through all of his films, whether it's the, uh, the Dalai Lama in Kundan, uh, 19th century uh, New York society in the uh, uh, Age of Innocence. Uh, it's all this in-group that dominates and controls uh, your life. And if you're put outside that, you die. It's a sign of destruction if you violate the code of that group. Uh, it's pure Catholic theology. It's uh, once you are outside, you're in big trouble. Uh, with that, there's a, uh, a sense of, of guilt and there are hostile forces outside. So if you communicate or collaborate with the hostile forces, members of another gang, another social class, another tribe, um, that's high treason. I've, I went from uh, Circeci in the fourth one I <clears throat> deal with in the book is Spike Lee, and that was one I was most um, unsure of. I, I know very little about the African American community, so I was dependent on a lot of uh, reading and, and uh, for background material there. Uh, one of the things that um, struck me about him and his background as an African-American is that it broke all the stereotypes that um, people coming from a white ghetto like me would uh, have. He was third generation college, so his family was better educated than mine. Uh, he lived in a middle class neighborhood. His uh, um, mother was a lawyer. Uh, his mother or grandmother, I forget now. Old people forget. <clears throat> uh, so she was able to bankroll some of his films. He got into uh, NYU, um, one of the prime film schools in the in the country. So you know, highly educated man. Uh, despite his uh, affecting street cred, you know, with the way he dresses and the way he talks and his language and everything, uh, the way that influenced his filmmaking is that um, he can be highly critical of uh, the black community. And uh, it's from the perspective of someone who has made it and um, why are you not making it? Uh, which means he has run into a lot of uh, criticism uh, from black critics 
uh, for his negative stance on some aspects of uh, African American society. And um, it's a tension. I mean, he's, uh, he could do a militant film like Malcolm X and at the same time uh, show the foibles of the community in uh, 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 Do the Right Thing or She's Gotta Have It um, or School Days. Um, and it didn't make him terribly popular. So uh, it's the same criticism that Alan always runs into when he's so critical about uh, uh, Jewish social patterns. They say, well, you're an anti-Semitic Jew, and it's not his point, but he's trying to be objective in pointing out uh, what he sees in, uh, in his own community. So that was the, um, the connecting link uh, where I tried uh, as a um, sort of modified auteur critic to deal mainly with directors and see the influences on their lives and see how their biographies influence the, uh, their artistic output. Street Smart um, was my last book. I've done a couple of um, major articles since then. The um, neglected Catholic filmmaker Leo McCary, uh, for one. And I've just done a um, long article again on Sorsese about his uh, subjectivism that you, uh, he really films through the mind and imagination of his characters. So. Uh, Frequently in his films, what appears on the screen is not reality, but it is the uh, subjective perception of the central character of the film. Uh, that was published um, last month. I think uh, with that, uh, my academic career is over. Uh, it's been a long run, uh, 32 years of uh, university, Association. Uh, I leave with mixed feelings. Uh, Boston College has been a very good home to me. I've uh, been able to do some good things with the uh, the film program and uh, make a contribution that's uh, satisfying. But um, there comes a time uh, when you have to say, um, "That's it." Um, other people are not like this, but for me, uh, it becomes more and more of an effort to relate to young people, uh, to share their interests. It becomes more of an effort to um, try to relate content in class lectures and uh, find things that would be of interest to them. Uh, we do not have a um, graduate program in um, film studies. So, and uh, professors in more traditional disciplines might um, extend their careers by having graduate seminars and directing dissertations. And um, I'm still trying to entertain 19-year-olds who find their smartphones infinitely more interesting than me. <clears throat> so, um, as I say, with mixed feelings, I decided um, that's it. I'm a former academic. Uh, I've been disposing of my library over the last uh, few months and gotten rid of uh, all the books. I have two more outstanding commitments to do book reviews, but uh, that's it. Uh, I have um, accepted a position in the um, Jesuit order, uh, the busiest one I've ever had in my life, of being administrator of the uh, Jesuit community at Boston College. Uh, that's um, 52 men, graduate students, retired people, um, 32 cars, seven houses, uh, three chapels, custodial staff, maintenance staff, uh, dining room, uh, guest lists uh, for hotels, uh, secretarial staff, uh, budgets, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's the first time I've done a, uh, a service job where I could be able to uh, develop another side of uh, my priesthood and Jesuit identity in doing something that's not academic. And um, if I can do that for another couple of years, that'll be a nice coda on uh, an academic and professorial career. So um, that's the end of my story at Boston College. <laughs>